Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Hail State Debate. Uh, it is February, that's Valentine's Month, so happy Valentine's Month, even though it is a made-up corporate holiday designed to sell you cards and chocolates. Um, uh, this month we have uh, an interesting topic, the, the one per year at least that we have, I think, on sort of global issues. Uh, this one is on intra-African policy as the area, and that is resolved on balance. The benefits of urbanization in West Africa outweigh the harms. Uh, as always, we want these videos to be useful to you. So if, if it is, uh, maybe like, maybe subscribe, maybe tell a friend. As usual, we're going to have the links and timestamps in the notes below. And if you want to keep up with our general musings on life and debate, you can always follow us on Twitter at Hale State Debate. So there's a lot to cover, so let's jump right into it. Uh, my initial thoughts, I've got a few of them. Number one, the topic in general, I don't love it, I don't hate it, I understand why we want to have a topic that gets outside of sort of the United States comfort zone, uh, and I think that's important to like a well-rounded education. Um, I think the issue is certainly one that's worthy. I probably would have worded it a little differently. I probably would have used sub-Saharan Africa as opposed to West Africa, just because as I've done the research on this, one thing we found is that so much of the data uh, on the topic is, is really more about urbanization in the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa. And while there is some that looks to West Africa in particular, most of it is more general. So that might have been a better reflection of the data and, and the literature, but that's no big deal. Um, but overall, I think it'll be fairly balanced. As we'll talk about in a minute, I think it has a little bit of a con bias to it, and we'll talk about why. Um, in terms of strategy, I think a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, this is going to be a topic that is very much about looking at reams and reams and mountains of data, right, but being able to tell a story with it, right? So you're going to see, for example, data that says that uh, levels of poverty overall are somewhat lower in West African cities than they are in West African rural areas. Does that mean that the con just throws up its hands and says, okay, pro just wins the poverty issue? Well, no. You have to be able to take that data and reason through it and tell the judge a story, for example, if you're on the con, about why it's not that cities are making people better off. It may be that they are siphoning people who have certain skills and abilities out of rural areas, but they're not creating any net gain, right? They're not doing, for example, what we've seen urbanization do in other areas of the world, which is create much more productive, prosperous cities. And there's plenty of information in the data about out there about how West African urbanization, it really operates differently. Uh, and sub-Saharan African urbanization operates differently than what we've seen in places like the United States and Europe and Asia. It's not leading to the kinds of prosperity that you see in those places. And so it's really important to be able to step back, right, and not just take the first level statistic. Oh, well, they've got slightly less poverty. I guess that means they're good. Well, you know, maybe not, right? Maybe the story is more complex than that. And to be able to tell that story and explain it to the judge in, in a clear way in your own words using plain English. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. But it's just as much a storytelling topic as it is a statistics topic, even though there's a lot of data out there on it, right? The second thing you need to do is you need to really be able to respect the complexity of the topic area, right? So West Africa is a region that, depending on how you define it, is more populous than the United States with over 350 million people. It's also arguably at least as diverse as the United States, really much more with, you know, it has massive sprawling cities like Lagos, Nigeria, which is the largest city in Africa with roughly 14 million residents. Uh, all the way to remote tiny villages, half a dozen or more major languages, hundreds of smaller ones, countless different ethnic groups, uh, a dozen or more than a dozen different national governments, right? And so as far as impacts on the debate, it's really, first of all, it's imperative that you show respect for the topic. There's nothing worse than, you know, privileged US, kids from the U.S., treating Africa as though it was just one monolithic place. That's almost kind of a cliche. If you want to show that you are kind of oblivious to how big the world is, one sure way to do it is to treat all of Africa or even all of West Africa as though it is one place. So having a degree of respect for the diversity and, and, and the differences that you see within the region is really important. But I also think that that does create a little bit of a challenge for the pro, right? Because the pro, it, arguably, with any resolution, you expect the pro to either establish that it is categorically a true statement, right? Or at least generally a true statement, right? And so one thing that the con might say is kind of a strategic matter is that West Africa is so diverse and there's so many different circumstances, so many different types of cities uh, that you can't really make a single, 
you know, characterization about the whole thing. I actually don't think the con has to get to that point. I think the con can win on much more straight up arguments than that. But you just have to be mindful that you are not speaking in sort of these sort of condescending, generalizing terms about the region, even though, right, you've got four minutes and you do have to move kind of quickly. So be mindful of that. And I guess the last thing I'd say about it is I think you have to be aware that there is a fairly strong con bias on the topic, right? And, and the reason for that is because if you look at the phrasing of the topic, it doesn't ask what we should do in West Africa, right? It doesn't propose a policy in West Africa. It's, ta it's asking us to do a balancing, right, on balance to weigh whether or not urbanization has achieved more good than harm in West Africa. And, and there, the overwhelming consensus of the data, right, the overwhelming consensus of the of the sources on this will tell you that frankly urbanization has not achieved nearly as much in Africa as it had at comparable phases right in North America in Europe in Asia it just hasn't gotten there partly because some of the prerequisites to healthy urbanization like industrialization right and building infrastructure those things just haven't happened and it's not really debatable they just haven't happened and the economic impacts you know have not been what you've seen in those other areas and some of the downsides right uh, slums health issues you know just lack of income in, you know increase uh, those are just verifiable facts. And so if the con wins the idea that we're just taking a snapshot, right, of the way West African urbanization is right now, there's a strong argument that right now, you know, it, it's, it's in a pretty lousy state compared to what you see in the rest of the world. And so the pro is going to have to try to push back and argue that, you know, urbanization might be seen as sort of a prerequisite to future gains. But that's kind of hard, right, when the topic seems to suggest we're asking what it has done. And so we're going to have to talk later about whether the pro has any ability in this debate to kind of shift the framework a little bit and maybe consider some of those potential future benefits, right, that urbanization hopefully will lead to but maybe haven't been achieved yet. And that's kind of a tall order in, a, in an event that's not supposed to be super theory heavy. So anyway, those are my initial thoughts on strategy. Uh, I think there are a lot of different angles you can take. Uh, some A little bit of an uphill battle for the pro, but we'll, we'll jump right into it. So we'll go uh, definition first as usual then we'll do some background information about the region and about urbanization then the pro then the con and then some final thoughts okay so let's talk a little bit about definitions I, I don't think we're gonna have to spend too much time on this but there are two definitions I think that are worth mentioning here I understand that in public forum in most circuits in most places we don't spend a lot of time reading elaborate definitions in the case but as you know it's important to have these in your back pocket in your files or at least in your mind uh, so that you're ready to fight over any of these sort of little topicality fights or fights about whose ground is what right when you get into the debate round the two that I'm going to talk about are going to be what you might expect which will be West Africa and urbanization so we'll just talk a little bit about those so on West Africa the, the countries that this encompasses uh, are going to differ depending on the source that you look at right uh, I think probably if you want to have something to just sort of cut the Gordian knot it, on the off chance you get into a fight about like whether a particular country like is Mauritania part of you know if, if somebody's running a case with a bunch of examples from there is that part of West Africa probably the single most authoritative place, authoritative place that you can look would be to like reputable NGOs that like define the region for purposes of their like programs right so for example the United Nations has a sub-region that is West Africa, right? So, and we're gonna to link to that source, and that would be a handy thing to have, right? If you ever had to get in a fight about, you know, what countries are in and what countries are not. I don't think you're gonna to have to do that a lot, but, you know, it could come up. Um, there is, though, some debate, right, about, about which countries are considered West Africa. For example, you know, the Britannica article we have here in the slide talks about how there's a difference between, like, Western Africa and West Africa proper, with West Africa being a little bit smaller and excluding some of the countries that would be in Western Africa. It seems like, from what I've seen, that the consensus is that these countries are definitely part of it. Like, the smallest version that everyone can agree on would be Benin, Burkina Faso, Cabo Verde, Cote d'Ivoire. 
the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Togo, and at least the sub-Saharan parts of Mali, right? One quick aside, make sure you get your pronunciations right. I can't even be sure that I got all my pronunciations right there, but I'm not going to have to go debate it, right? So if you're not absolutely sure how something's pronounced, maybe hit the little button in the Wikipedia article if they have one that actually says it for you and pronounces it, because uh, nothing can make you look dumber faster than confidently pronouncing something wrong repeatedly. You don't want to do that, right? Um, one other thing about the definition of West Africa is that, and it's not really about the definition, but just a lot of the sources on this topic, as we're going to see in a minute, are going to be about sub-Saharan Africa uh, as opposed to West Africa specifically. That's just what the literature is, right? There are some sources where we will be talking about West Africa in particular, and I'll try to point those out, but they're limited, right? The vast majority of academic research looks more broadly to sub-Saharan Africa, maybe even to just Africa more broadly, right? And you're going to have to be able to explain why if you use those sources, which you almost have to, right? Why are you using them, right? And, you know, we've already talked about how you want to be respectful of the differences between countries and recognize that certain regions, you know, they're not all monolithic, but you're still going to have to use sources that talk about sub-Saharan Africa. So you need to be able to explain, right, why you're doing that and to say, look, we recognize there are differences, but many of the problems faced by these cities and many of the successes of these cities are very generalizable to sub-Saharan Africa. So, for example, I think when you're talking about like the growth or the lack of growth from urbanization or the, the poverty alleviation or the lack thereof from urbanization or the environmental threats and things like that, there are strong arguments that these problems are fairly generic, right, across all of sub-Saharan Africa and thus would be applicable to West Africa. But you have to be aware of that. You have to be mindful as you're doing your research and you have to be able to explain, if called on it, you know, why are you using sources about all of sub-Saharan Africa, the answer in real terms is that's where, that's what the sources are, right? And for the most part, they are applicable here, right? But the bottom line is you're going to have to use them and you need to be prepared to explain why you're using them. So then moving on to urbanization, um, you know, be mindful. One thing that's really important when we talk about urbanization is it's very easy to think of urbanization as just like we've got a city and it gets bigger, right? In other words, you know, San Francisco used to be a big city, now it's a huge city, right? New York used to be a big city, now it's a huge city. Cities grow bigger, right? But it is more complex than that. So, you know, at minimum, as and we have here on the slide the United Nations 2018 report on urbanization, and we have a good sort of quote about a complex socioeconomic process here, it really involves at least two things, right? One is you've got people shifting into existing urban environments, right? People leaving the countryside, moving into the city, the city grows bigger, the infrastructure grows bigger and that sort of thing. But number two, and this is also important, right? You also see the growth of like former rural settlements into more urban ones, like places that used to be farm towns, people that used places that used to be small towns growing into more urbanized settings. And I think that that probably is going to be something that people don't pay a whole lot of attention to on this topic. Now, I wasn't able to find sources that would let me run like an entire case about like the growth of small towns. I don't think that would be a fair assessment like on balance. I don't think that would cover the entire topic. But it's important to realize we're not just talking again about a city like Lagos, Nigeria going from 10 million to 14 million. We can easily be talking about a 5,000 person farm town growing over the course of decades to a 50,000 person, you know, small city, right? So just be aware of that distinction, right? Um, it's really hard to define exactly what urbanization is in very technical terms, though, because first of all, the definition of what is urban, right? I mean, uh, it, it's there are numerous definitions from different countries have different definitions of what an urban area is. So, for example, if you look at, you know, some of the sources, you'll find like charts, right, that list all the different definitions that people have, that countries have, that, that statistical organizations have, right, about what constitutes an urban area. I don't think, once again, that it's necessary to get too deep into the weeds on this. I think most judges and, frankly, most teams are going to accept the idea that a growing city, right, represents you know, uh, urbanization, uh, whether it's a massive city or a mid-sized city. But a, a really good way to capture it is from the UN's 2018 World or Urbanization Prospects Report. And it just says, as we see here, urbanization is a complex socioeconomic process that transformed the built environment, converting formerly rural into urban settlements while also shifting the spatial distribution of population from urban to rural areas. In other words, people moving and places growing, right? So just be aware that it is a little bit more complex than that. Again, I don't think you're gonna have a whole lot of fights on it. 
So with that, I think those are the only two kind of specific definitions we have, but there's a whole lot more background sort of history and economic theory that we need to talk about. So let's jump right into that now. Okay, so let's talk about some factual background. Now this is gonna be the most important section of the video, right? So perk your ears up and make sure you pay attention. It's gonna be more important than the pro and con arguments we'll talk about later. We're gonna give you plenty of links to potential sources, a lot of stuff to mine, a lot of good sources out there, but the factual background is gonna be more important for two reasons. First of all, this is a topic that for most of your judges, they're gonna know very little or nothing about. Now we may wish that the news media in the United States did a better job of covering global issues, but generally they don't. And unless you have uh, you know, a particular interest in West Africa, this is not gonna be something that you've thought about a lot, right? It's not gonna be something like the Medicare for all topic. So right off the bat, you're gonna to need to be able to explain and frame why we're even talking about this, just to have it make sense to the judge, right? But more importantly, there are some specific factual issues that deal with kind of the, the unique economic circumstances of West Africa uh, that, that, that lead us to understand why we're even debating this in the first place, right? Because historically, urbanization has generally been not an unmitigated good, but overall a major benefit to humankind. And we need to understand why we're even debating whether that's the case, right? So it's important that we follow along and make sure we understand that. So we're going to go in three stages. First, we're going to talk about why urbanization is generally considered a prerequisite to economic growth. Second, we're going to talk about what has happened with respect to urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa and West Africa. And then lastly, we're going to talk about why that urbanization in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, is different than urbanization that we've seen in the rest of the world and why that makes this a unique and debatable topic, right? So let's start at the beginning. Urbanization is a prerequisite to growth. The basic story that economists and historians are going to tell you is that urbanization is sort of the gatekeeper to all uh, to all major economic growth and prosperity, right? There's an overwhelmingly strong correlation between the rise of cities in, the, in Europe, the U.S., and Asia, right? And on the one hand, and economic growth and rising incomes on the other. You have to start agglomerating people together into cities for them to reach their maximum economic productivity. And the reason for that is fairly straightforward. The basic idea is cities are places where you concentrate more people with more skills and more abilities alongside more businesses. You mix them all together and people are able to pursue whatever their highest and best calling is. Whereas if they were in a small rural village, there might or might not be a need for whatever their talent or skill is, right? So for example, just very simple story. If I am a talented mechanic, right, and I live in a small remote village, well, I can contribute to the well-being of my village by like fixing the handful of cars and trucks that people have there, right? But if I move to a large city, right, well, then I can work in a large mechanic shop, you know, that 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 sees hundreds of cars per week come through. And maybe if I'm really good, I can start supervising and teaching other mechanics and they can apply their skills. I can make more money doing that for myself. And I can also contribute more to the overall welfare of society. And you can take mechanic and apply that to anything, doctor, lawyer, teacher, whatever you want, right? You can find your highest and best purpose when you're serving more people and you have more opportunities, right? And that's what cities have historically done. And if you want a, a basic story of that, this article, the World Bank Development Report from back in 2009, a little bit dated, but it's still a really good source. And it has this money quote here that I think, you know, many, uh, you know, many on the pro are probably going to want to work into the case, right? No country has grown to middle income without industrial and urbanizing. None has grown to high income without vibrant cities. The rush to cities in developing countries seems chaotic, but it is necessary, right? Uh, in other words, it has to happen. It might be hard, it might be difficult, but there's no way to get to prosperity if you don't go through that, right? Um, so if you want to look, you know, sort of more recently and more currently, on the next slide, we talk about how there is a close correlation today you know, because of because of the these themes we've talked about historically between urbanization and prosperity. If you look at this chart, this is from Our World in Data, uh, and it comes from the UN. The data they take is from the UN World Urbanization Prospects in 2018. And as you can see, uh, the, the the higher incomes correlate very heavily. Uh, with higher percentages of urbanization. It's not a straight line, but it's pretty close, right? The, there, there's a strong linear correlation that the richer you are, the more likely you are to be highly urbanized, right? And, you know, that, that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. That's really, really important. It doesn't mean if you start having massive cities that you are automatically always 
going to see you know massive levels of prosperity but it does imply a strong correlation right you know this narrative is not unchallenged right one article that we're going to link to from chen et al in 2014 has a really good point about how really it's it's more about how you do urbanization than just whether it happens and certain prerequisites have to happen in order for cities to make people more prosperous right but the general narrative is that you have to go through urbanization if you want to reach high levels of prosperity and if you think about it if you think back to like you know the history of the United States and, and you could use this as an analogy if you're the pro you know the, the cities in the United States and in Europe were chaotic dirty dangerous poorly regulated places once too right if you watch movies like Gangs of New York right you can see New York you know back in the late 19th century if you read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle about you know sort of early industrial revolution Chicago you're going to see places that were dirty and dangerous and crowded and didn't seem to have the right kinds of infrastructure right uh, but eventually they, they got through that phase and it led them to, you know, dramatically higher levels of prosperity for all involved. Right. So uh, that's the general history of urbanization. Right. It is a, a doorway that we walk through. We put people in the same place. We allow them to work in whatever their most efficient capacity is. We let that go for a while. And over time, we see, you know, uh, prosperity rise, wages rise, people are dragged out of poverty. And we'll talk about the statistics on that later on on the pro, but that's the general story. So how has it worked out in West Africa? Well, let's first talk about the, the, the factual history of West Africa before we move on to kind of the narrative. So um, urbanization as a general matter tends to happen pretty rapidly. In other words, uh, a region will be relatively agrarian for a long, long time, and then at some point a, a switch will flip, the, the conditions will be met, and you'll start to see urbanization happen pretty rapidly. That was true in the United States. It's been true in Europe. It's certainly been true over the last 50 years in Asia. And now that it's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are no exception. You've seen very you know, rapid urbanization. So this is from the 2020 OECD report, Africa's Urbanization Dynamics 2020. And as you can see, uh, from 1950 to 2015, you've seen a 2,000% increase in Africa's urban population. That's 20 times as many people. Uh, if you look at the chart on the right in the slide, it breaks it down by region, so you can't actually see West Africa. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but what you basically want to look at is the, the, the chart above the line there. And as you can see, you know, although it was faster from 1950 to 1980, all of these numbers are showing you over 4% annual growth in urban population. And you say, well, Brett, 4% doesn't sound like much, but if you know anything about investing, if you get 4% year after year after year after year, again and again and again, and you compound it over 10, 20, 30, or in this case, 65, 70 years, right, you're going to see dramatic increase. So this has been a rapid, constant growth, you know, of urbanization throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. In other words, same thing you've seen in other parts of the world. It's, this is just Africa's, you know, Western Africa's time to do it, right? Uh, and then all of the projections are that we're going to continue to see this through the next couple of decades. So, for example, this example, this Gunnar Alp and, and others piece says that we're, you know, over the next couple of decades, we expect to see, you know, uh, the urban population of Africa as a whole move from 395 million to 1.339 billion in 2050. In other words, to see that it's it's going to triple, right? Uh, the piece on the other side from Walther says that, you know, between 2015 and 2040, the population of West Africa will double and cities will absorb most of this demographic growth. So that's uh, West Africa in particular. So we can expect that this is going to continue going forward at, at essentially the same clip. So that's basically what's happened, rapid urbanization. And if you just knew about that, you might say to yourself, well, fantastic, right? That's wonderful. That means we're going to see the same growth that we saw in New York and Chicago, uh, in Paris, in Beijing, and all of these other cities. They're going to grow. They're going to become prosperous. They might have their problems. They might have some pollution. But eventually, they're going to, they're going to get rich and get out of poverty. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence that, that that may not be the case, that urbanization in Africa might be, di might be different, right? And that's, that's really the reason we're debating this topic, right? And so the, the slide I have here is that West African urbanization doesn't seem to be following global trends, right? So the basic global trend is that technology lets you industrialize, it lets you expand your city, increase your per capita productivity. People move to the cities to make more money, their incomes rise. As they rise, they become more productive and there's sort of a virtuous cycle of more more people move in, they become more productive, the city grows, everybody gets wealthier. But there's overwhelming evidence, and we're going to give you numerous sources on this, that Sub-Saharan African 
cities are not following this pattern. People are moving there and their populations are growing to escape rural poverty and things along those lines, right? But they are not seeing, right, dramatic increases in their productivity and they are not seeing, you know, dramatic improvements in their standard of living. So the Gunnar Alt piece here explains, you know, basically the difference. You're seeing unemployment rates are high, 60% of jobs are in the informal or gray economy, right? People are not moving there and getting jobs as doctors and lawyers and things like that. And then this piece from Turok and McGranahan talks about how actually paradoxically, you know, it may be that that cities are not only not adding to productivity and economic growth and wealth, but they actually may be one of the reasons why uh, Africa has stagnated, right? And you say to yourself, well, well, how could that be, right? Like, how could it possibly be that Africa, Western Africa, is such an exception here? And the basic reason that a lot of these pieces give is that Africa has unfortunately skipped a step in the process, right? Usually when urbanization happens, it comes alongside industrialization and the growth of industry. Big industry grow up in these cities and they draw people from the countryside in because they can pay more, right? But that's not happening in Western Africa and it's not happening to a large... I mean, it's happening in some places. We can't oversimplify. But broadly speaking, it's not what's driving right urbanization what is driving it well a lot of the a lot of the growth in these cities is simply the fact that uh, fertility rates in africa just having lots of children people move to the cities and typically you know in the united states and other places when you move to the city you tend to have fewer children because the cost of living and space and things like that right but in in sub-saharan africa fertility rates are still very high so you just have a lot of kids being born in the city which doesn't necessarily make the place any more productive or prosperous it just leads to more people but the other thing is in in many cases cases moving people do move to the city but they move and it's really just part of a zero-sum game they're moving to the city because that's where all the other people are right and if you want to be able to sell your labor well if all the people are in the city then that's where you have to go to sell your labor because that's where the people who will buy it are but you know th the cities are getting bigger without getting better there's no new industry right and there's no new industry to build the need for for like support industries like you know transportation and you know lawyers and doctors and things like that so so it ends up just being a place where everybody goes there because that's where everybody is. And when you don't have that growth, as these, these articles will show you, the ones we link to, then what you end up having is rather than a city where the rising tide lifts all boats, you end up having just massive, you know, a few parts of the city might be very prosperous, right? But overwhelmingly, it's going to be surrounded by massive slums. And I'm hesitant to use that word because it's kind of pejorative, but it's absolutely true. Many of these large African cities, West African cities, are surrounded by shame shanty towns, slums, places that are unsanitary, they're dangerous, they are in many cases very lawless because the economic growth to support neighborhoods, de high density housing, you know, safe places to live is, is just not there, right? So for example, uh, the World Development Report, from, this is from back in 1999 and 2000, this is quoted by Turok and McGranahan, who we're going to drop a link to, but it says, um, African cities are exceptional in failing to serve as drivers of growth. Instead, they are part of the cause and a major symptom of the economic and social crises that have enveloped the continent. Various observers have suggested that Africa may have urbanized prematurely in response to push factors like rural droughts, falling agricultural prices, and ethnic conflicts rather than the pull of economic opportunities. In other words, people are coming to cities because the places they're from are just absolutely desperate and they just need to go somewhere where they can find some kind of job but not necessarily something that's going to make, you know, the country as a whole dramatically more prosperous, right? Another more recent source with some really excellent cards on the difference between urbanization in Africa and elsewhere is Homan and Law's uh, 2019 World Bank Report. This is a fantastic piece. I would encourage everybody, you know, to, to go and read this. Uh, it would be for me my MVP source on this. You can easily write like more than one con case just from the stuff that they have. You can cut a lot of fantastic con cards because they explain very clearly and in depth with like really nice little headings and things like that why cities in Africa are not seeing the level of economic growth you need to see increasing prosperity, to meet the needs, to build the infrastructure and things like that. It also has a few good pro cards in it too. So this is going to be the thing where if you, if you don't read any of the sources other than one, this is going to be the 
the one that I would recommend. And then the last thing in terms of background would be just, you know, talking a little bit about sort of two framing issues in the debate. And you may or may not, you know, actually say these out loud in the round and sort of explicitly spell them out, but there are two things to think about, right? Anytime we have a topic that asks us to do like a cost benefit analysis, you know, there are a couple of questions that we have to ask and you just want to be conscious of these, right? Um, the first one is when we're talking about benefits and harms, benefits and harms to whom, right? Uh, who, who counts? Who's relevant when we do the calculus of benefits and harms? So the simplest framing would be just to look at the people in these West African cities themselves, right? But you could potentially go broader than that. What about people in, in West African countries who are not in urban areas but may have their lives affected, you know, nonetheless because maybe you're seeing a drain of capital and a drain of people out of rural areas and maybe that's making them even poorer, right? Do, they, do their interests count? I think most people would say probably so. But what if you go even more more broadly than that. For example, if we talk about climate change and we talk about environmental degradation and things like that, do the interests of people in, in the broader world count, right? So uh, do the harms of climate change, you know, which may or may not be felt directly by a, an individual moving to a West African city, but, but are felt by the world as a whole, should those be put on the scales as well? And if they are, should they be assigned less weight, right, than the impact on an actual person in a West African city? A more important framing question is going to be, though, um, do, do possible or likely future benefits and harms count, right? In other words, when we say on balance benefits outweigh the harms, are we just taking a snapshot of the way the world is right now in West African cities and with West African urbanization? Or can we also consider the benefits of urbanization, uh, or maybe also the harms, but the benefits of urbanization that we think might happen in the future, right? And this is really important because the overwhelming bulk of the literature, I think, suggests that if you just take a snapshot of the state of cities in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa right now, frankly, you're going to find that they are, they're, they're, they're not in the same shape that their counterparts in other parts of the world were at the same stage of development. They're not producing a economic growth. They're not producing better standards of living, sanitation, things like that. Now, there is some counter evidence. The pro has some, some good options here, but the bulk of the, the evidence seems to suggest that. So one theory that the pro is going to want to try to run with is that when you do urbanization and you go through this hard initial phase of urbanization, right, you're doing it so that you, you sort of have a chance right, of having higher levels of prosperity down the road. Remember, we said earlier that no country has reached middle income without going through urbanization. So one theory the pro would like to be able to argue is, look, remember, cities in the United States and Europe were rough and dirty and dangerous, like gangs of New York and, and things like that in their early phases. They're not places you would want to live in, right? But it was a necessary phase to even have a chance at reaching these higher levels of prosperity. So one thing the pro would like to argue is that even just having a chance to move up the ladder economically in the future is something we should consider as a benefit. It may not have accrued to us right now. It might be like an investment we put in the bank that's going to pay off one day or might pay off one day, but we should consider that future opportunity for prosperity to be a benefit because if we don't do urbanization at all, the pro will argue, if we just don't, if it doesn't happen, if everybody just stays in tiny rural villages, right, then we really historically have no serious serious opportunity to see the standards of living and the economic levels in West Africa rise to the level of what we would colloquially call the developed world. No country has ever done that without urbanization. So the con would love to argue that we take a snapshot, we look at how good these cities are, what benefits and harms they have now, and we say that the harms outweigh the benefits and that's it. The pro would on the other hand like to say, no, this is a process. We have sort of gotten on the, we have bought our ticket for the train and the ride right now might be difficult and painful and it might not be fun. The cities might not be good places to live, but if we don't go through this process, we have 0% chance of rising to a higher level of income. So the question of when the benefits accrue, can future benefits to prosperity through urbanization be considered relevant in the round, I think is hugely relevant. And if the pro doesn't win that framing argument, if the pro does not convince the judge that you can look to potential future benefits, I think they've got a major uphill battle. 
On the other hand, if they convince the judge that you know, urbanization is just a long, difficult process, but it ultimately is the only way you get out of poverty, then they've got a tremendous advantage in the round, right? And so those are just a couple of framing issues that kind of go with the background information. And so that's a lot to take in, I know, but I think that's what you need in order to be able to, you know, understand the topic. So with that, let us move on to what I know you've all been waiting for, which is the pro arguments and then the con arguments. Okay, so let's do some pro arguments. Uh, initially, when we started researching this, I felt like the pro had a decided disadvantage from what I was reading in, in a lot of the literature. But the more that we've, we've looked at it and the more research we've done, I, I think for purposes of a PF case at least, right, something that has to be done in four minutes, I think the pro is in a better position than I initially thought. So I've got two basic strategies, right, that I think I would consider for the pro, and I probably would work both of them into, into my case if I were writing one. I'm going to talk about them in order, right? The first one is going to be the benefits that I would contend are happening now in the status quo, stuff that we can say, you know, is currently present tense the result of urbanization, or at least make that argument. Uh, these are moderately sized impacts, but you, you have a very strong argument that they're happening. They're easy to link to, right? The second half, though, will be in the second strategy would be uh, this idea that urbanization in the long run is giving us a chance to link to bigger benefits. Now, again, that takes some, some, some arguing, right? It takes some work to get the judge to accept that buying a, a, a ticket, a lottery ticket or whatever, for something in the future counts as a benefit, right? But I think, frankly, that's what the, the real argument is in the literature. It's not that cities are great now. It's that urbanization gives you a chance to get to a better place. So the second half of the, of the strategy will be pointing to some of the general global benefits of urbanization that, frankly, West African cities are not really achieving now, but have the potential to achieve, right, if we continue to do urbanization and we do it right, right? So I think that that one-two punch lets you have some medium-sized guaranteed impacts, right, for safety, right? And then maybe some bigger, I would call stretch impacts that you can access if the judge accepts that the, the difficult process of urbanization gives you a chance at something and that chance is fairly considered program, right? So let's talk about it. So number one, and the thing you're going to have to have, I think, in every case is the idea that urbanization is currently lowering poverty in the status quo, right? So even if it's not as effective at lowering poverty as in some other regions, like in the United States and Europe and Asia, it still is resulting in significant absolute declines in poverty, right? So if we look first to the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative in 2014, they have this thing called the multidimensional poverty index. And no, it doesn't go between like different dimensions and compare like what the world would have been like, you know, if, if, uh, if things had been different. It looks at different aspects of things like health, education, and the standard of living. It adjusts for the cost of living. We don't really have time to explain it, but it's a good metric of overall poverty. And what it points out is that, you know, in these uh, West African countries, well, rather in Sub-Saharan African countries, again, that's where the data is, we have to use it, 85% of those in poverty live in rural areas. And that's despite the fact that the overall population of Sub-Saharan Africa is only 59% rural. So there's a big disparity and you're much more likely to be poor if you live in a rural area of Sub-Saharan Africa. So there's just a major disparity where you can see right off the bat that poverty is much more concentrated in rural areas right, than it is in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa. But then if you look at the Homan and Law piece, remember I told you told you that Homan and Law is mainly a con side piece, but they have some good pro, pro data in it, right? Well, what this shows you, and this is from pages six through eight, right, of that piece, it shows you that in sub-Saharan Africa, overall poverty rates as a percentage of population are at about 22% in urban areas compared to 39% overall nationally and 47% in rural areas, right? And the larger the urban area, the lower the poverty. Large urban areas are the lowest with 9% poverty rates. And if you look and you see the trend line there, you know, largest city is that orange line on the bottom. It's the one that has been going down the fastest. We have seen the sharpest decline from about 30% poverty in 2000 down to 2014. 
Well, now, look, we can get into a bunch of fancy schmancy debates about why this is happening, whether these things are causing it. But at the end of the day, one of the things the pros going to want to argue to the judges, you know, at the, you got to just cut the Gordian knot. You know, that's an old expression. You just got to, you know, just make a decision. Right. And if we're seeing these massive disparities with, you know, less poverty in, in these cities, somebody's doing something right. We may not be able to say that they're as good as everywhere else, but something must be going right in these cities if poverty is that much, you know, dramatically lower than in rural areas, right? Now, in terms of talking about like individual people's incomes, I'll be candid with you. There's some pretty good data on the other side on the con that says you're you're not really seeing a lot of, of income growth in these cities. You know, people who move there could have commanded a similar income elsewhere. There is at least one source that you can try, and I'm gonna give you some caveats about this source to argue that, that maybe individuals are being lifted out of poverty if you wanna work on the individual level, and that is this Turok and Visaji 2017 piece. Right. And it says that moving to cities has lifted over 300,000 South Africans out of poverty, even in difficult times. You say, yes. You know, is this about, you know, is this about South Africa? Yes, it is. And didn't I just say, don't conflate all of Africa together? I did. But this is this is the data we have. If you find something better, great. Good for you. I hope it works well for you. Uh, but I think you can argue that many of the problems that are faced you know, with urbanization in South Africa are similar to West Africa. And if you look to what they say in this piece, they basically say, you know, by their analysis, if they look at what's called the National Income Dynamics Study, and they track the progress of a representative sample of 30,000 people, in other words, they follow them from like when they move to the city, and they follow them and they, and they see, you know, how much better are you doing when you move from place X to place Y. And from that 30,000 person sample, they extrapolated that in the population as a whole, 385,000 people in South Africa, which is just one country right just one country were lifted above the poverty line in a six-year span now again you're going to have to make the argument that we can extrapolate this to west africa i don't think that's a huge jump right but the basic argument is they are in these cities finding greater opportunities the opportunities may not be as dramatically better as you would have seen in chicago or in san francisco or in uh, beijing right but they are good enough to lift hundreds of thousands of people in one single country out of poverty right and even if they do nothing else judge uh, one thing you really can argue i think on the pro is especially if you feel strong about your anti-poverty arguments is that judges should weigh anti-poverty arguments more highly than anything else right because rescuing people from the depths of abject poverty the dangers to their health the dangers of death just the suffering the lack of food the lack of sanitation getting people out of that so that they just have enough to live on should weigh more heavily than anything, including abstract concerns like the environment or anything else, right? So if you feel like he can do that strongly, um, then, then, then you might want to run with that kind of weighing. Like we have to put poverty alleviation first, right? Um, another argument though, you know, I think it just kind of turning the page a little bit is the idea that big cities can dramatically raise standards of living, like the, the actual cities that exist in sub-Saharan Africa. This is another one of the existing benefits. And this, again, comes from Homan and Law, just kind of showing their, their diversity here. This is uh, their World Bank report from 2019. And what it talks about is how large cities in sub-Saharan Africa dramatically increase access to water, sanitation, and electricity by 45, 35, and 50 percent respectively. Now, this is important, number one, as an impact in and of itself, just access to basic needs increasing by huge, huge numbers, right? Um, but in addition, as we're going to talk about later, it's a fantastic answer to a lot of the horror stories that the con is going to read you about how these people are living in slums and they lack access to sanitation. And one of the things that the pro is going to be saying in response to that again and again and again is, look, I can't deny that people in West African cities are living in slums and they do have standards of living that we in the United States would, would, would think are lower than ours and we would not want we would not want those standards for ourselves, right? But they're better than the alternative, right? In other words, Africa overall is an impoverished continent for lots of reasons that go back to colonialism and the slave trade and many other factors, right? But they're doing better in cities than they would be in rural areas, significantly better in terms of access to water, sanitation, and electricity. So you can tell all the horror stories you want, but what you have to remember is they were even worse when they were in these remote villages that in many cases wouldn't have any access to water, sanitation, electricity, and these things. There are other parts of the Homan and Lowell article, if you want to go through, that also talk about how in cities we're seeing lower fertility rates for women. And you might think that like 
like that's bad, like you're having fewer children. But the truth is, in Africa, there's a strong argument that we want to lower fertility rates because women in, in that part of the world are still having more children than what's called the replacement rate. In other words, every generation we still see in, increases in population, whereas in the United States, it's roughly even. And in Europe, it's actually losing people. In Japan, that's true as well. Right. And so because Africa is so limited in many cases in terms of resources and the ability to provide for people, many scholars that we actually want to be lowering fertility rates down to what's called the replacement level. And the Homan and Law piece also has data that says that that's going on in cities, too. And that actually makes sense because in cities you have, you know, that happens in cities all over the world. You have to you live in an apartment rather than on a farm. There's less space. It's a little bit more expensive to have kids and send them to school. So you have fewer kids. Right. So that, you know, it's, now, to be clear, fertility rates are not down to where they need to be. And the con will point that out. But they're lower than they are in rural areas, right? That's the point, right? So again, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. That's a phrase I would use against the con. I would say, look, you know, we understand <laughs> this is not Paris. It's not Beijing. It's not New York. But it's better than the alternative. These people are not crazy. When they move to these cities, right, they're not doing it just because they, they're, they're, they're masochists and they want to suffer. They're doing it because while it's still tough, it's less bad for them, you know, right? And that's a point we want to make again and again. Now, to be fair, you know, the Holman and Law piece is saying that these things are happening mainly in a few large cities in sub-Saharan Africa, not in all cities. And they go to some great pains to say this is not happening everywhere. But a smart pro team will say, that's not a problem for us at all. That just means we haven't done enough urbanization, right? It, we want that, What that suggests is we want all of our cities to be bigger. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That's a little facile. And I'm sure that like real, you know, demographers and, and sociologists and stuff would say, oh, that's too simple. But for the purposes of a PF round saying, look, there's no problem with saying that these things are only happening in a few big cities. That's just a reason why urbanization is good. The places with the most urbanization are the places that are reaping the benefits. Now, on the other side of the coin, right, there are there are some sources that say, like in the present tense, right, small cities actually in sub-Saharan Africa are actually alleviating poverty faster than others. So there's this piece from Christiansen et al., and which just means and others, right, in 2013 that looks at um, Tanzania, which again, not not in the region, but we, we have to work with what we have, that talks about how people who live uh, in, in smaller cities, like small to medium-sized growing cities, are actually seeing uh, exiting poverty much more quickly than others. So if you maybe want to throw a little bit of a curveball at, uh, at the con, something they're not prepared for, that might be an option there. You know, another way of framing these arguments, I think, again, for the sort of the present tense benefits of of, of the pro is that, you know, just to say as bad as it is on the individual level, urban West Africa is better than the alternatives. And there's a good, I will admit, it's just a slideshow presentation from a, an, an academic named Joseph Tai for the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana in 2018. Um, but it has some good bullet points. I don't know how to verify them, right? This is just a, a, a presentation he did at an academic conference, but he is an academic. He is affiliated with the university. You know, and as you can see on the slide, you know, he has some sort of quotes and some anecdotes from individuals, you know, that, that might be useful in, in some types of cases to give it a little bit of a flavor and explain. But he basically says, look, here's what's going on. People are moving into these larger cities and as bad as they are, they're in slums, but 76% of them have the ability to save money, right? Which is something they weren't able to do before. And 78% of them are sending remittances, which is just money payments back to their relatives in rural parts of the country, which means they are transferring wealth. And that has kind of you know, a two pronged impact, right? On the one hand, it means that, you know, th they move to the city for a reason, they're doing better, they're saving, they're sending remittances. And then secondly, you know, that the remittances are helping people in rural regions. So this is kind of an individual level piece of evidence, you know, take a look at it, it doesn't look super formal, but it's from, a, I assume, a credible academic. Um, and it gives some kind of individual level evidence that it's just, you know, better than the alternative, right? And I think that, again, I've said this before, people are moving to these cities for a reason, for a reason right? And so, the, for example, there's a quote from The Economist in 2018. They have a piece about how African cities are not doing much to help their poor, right? It, but it has one good quote in it, and I'm going to link to it just for this quote, but it, it just says, migrants to African cities are not worse off than they were in the countryside. If that were the case, they would move back. 
right? And that's a good quote to have just to sort of, you know, illustrate that as bad as it is, it could always be worse. And I think that that is the main takeaway in terms of present tense benefits, which is that it may not be perfect, but they're moving there for a reason. They're not crazy. They're not masochists. They're not gluttons for punishment. They just know that it's it's better for them, you know, to be to be there. Now, the second strategy is to do a little bit more of a reach and to say, look, there are all of these big global benefits, right, uh, from urbanization that have been reaped in other areas like the United States, like Europe, like Asia, right? And if you want to even have a chance at them, you've got to go through the process of urbanization. So I'm just going to very quickly in the slides list a few of these benefits. You can sort of see on the slides themselves what we're doing with the cards. So the first one is, you know, there are cards out there that talk about how globally urbanization has yielded massive poverty reduction and maybe some, you know, maybe some uh, environmental benefits. This is from Jude Clement. Uh, I think this is in the Financial Times, but he has, you know, the quote, no country in the industrial age has ever achieved significant economic growth without urbanization. 80% of the developed nations are urbanized. And he also has a little bit of language in there about how urban populations, you know, you're using less space. And so it's a little bit more environmentally friendly. I'm going to honest, be honest with you there. I think that's an uphill battle to say that urbanization helps the environment. But having anything on that would be a good way to at least push back and try to fight for a stalemate on some of the cons environmental arguments, which we'll talk about in just a little while. Um, another point that you can have if you want to have just sort of reaching for the, the big global benefits, right? Globally, urbanization has yielded massive income gains. This is from uh, Glazer and Steinberg. And they talk about how you know, uh, if you just look broadly at World Bank data about urbanization in general, um, you, you're seeing that a 20 percentage point increase in urbanization is associated with more than a doubling of income. And that even if you regress out, for example, additional costs and, and the, the, the schooling and the abilities of the people that move there, you're still seeing massive income gains. And we've certainly seen much more than a 20 percentage point increase in urbanization in Africa. We, we may not get the doubling of income yet. In fact, we certainly haven't gotten that. But if we're able, as we're going to talk about in a minute, to argue that that is possible, then there's huge, huge gains to income that are out there to be had if we do this right. All right. Um, there's also from the same piece from Glazer and Steinberg an argument that globally urbanization has had benefits for democracy. And for example, they talk about how there is, they cite other scholars and say that African countries that experienced urban insurgency movements at the time of colonial independence are more likely to have democratic regimes today. They talk about how regimes like the Nazis had less support in cities and basically how more progressive, more, you know, sort of enlightened democratic parties tend to, you know, pro-democracy parties tend to have greater support in urban areas, whereas, you know, in, in rural regions, you have folks who might be more in favor of authoritarian, you know, rule. And so that's a, another possible, you know, impact that maybe, you know, some con teams wouldn't be looking for. I think, you know, on the environmental issue, let me talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I, I think broadly speaking, um, you know, environmental protection is going to be an anti-urbanization argument in most rounds. But I actually think there's some decent, you know, evidence out there that you can push back on and at least try to make it a draw, right? So if they're going to come and say urbanization leads to climate change, you know, there are some good cards, like, for example, this Jones and Kamen that talk about how if you can do urbanization right and you can build denser places where people are taking up less land, their carbon footprint, their household carbon footprint will go down. It's actually the sprawling suburb and other places that make it bad. Now, that's a little tough to sell in Africa because there is a lot of sprawl, right? There is a lot of, like, you know, slum and things like that. But at least, you know, that's something you can fight with. And then the National Research Council in 2009 talks about how the more densely you pack people into cities, the fewer vehicle miles they draw. I would probably not build a pro case around this, but I would try to have some some cards that let me push back on the environmental issue, just, just again, to fight it to sort of a draw, Right. But all of this is contingent upon the idea that you can sell your judge on the notion that Africa, West Africa, can still get it right. And this is what you would call colloquially in debate what's called a try or die argument. Um, that's what we would, would have called it like in policy debate, right? And the idea is that if we don't do urbanization, our chances to achieve all of these things are zero. If we try urbanization, as difficult as it might be right now, we have a chance because, as I've shown you, Judge, through numerous quotes, no country has ever done these things, right, without urbanizing, 
right? So it's try or die. We either stay in abject rural poverty and just resign ourselves to that, right? Or we make an attempt at it. Now to sell that, you're going to need to have some source in your case that talks about how we can actually do this, right? How it can work. And that's where a lot of these sources that kind of give roadmaps for like how urbanization can be improved, right? So what you would want to do is read some of these impacts from globalization and then just have a portion of the case where you say, and by the way, this is absolutely achievable. Here's how and read one or two sources saying this can be done. So for example, one is this one from Stephen Commons, which is from urban fragility to urban stability. And like many pieces, it has kind of a roadmap for how some African cities are improving on these issues of like infrastructure and how others can do that. And the basic argument would be, you know, it, this is not impossible. It can be done. Right. So what we're saying is give Africa, you know, give West Africa some non-zero chance to try to do the things that are prescribed here so that it can achieve all these wonderful benefits the rest of the world has. Don't give up. And then you kind of, because of the phrasing of the resolution, have to argue that that chance, right, that golden ticket, Right. Even though you might lose, even though you might not get there, you still have a fighting chance. It's like if you're a patient that has a serious, maybe terminal illness. And yesterday they told you you had a zero percent chance of surviving. But today you take some kind of medication and they say, congratulations. I know the medicine made you feel miserable, but now you have a 40 percent chance of surviving. Well, that's not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better than zero percent. And that's kind of what urbanization is for West Africa. It's a it's a bitter medicine that you have to take but if you don't take it you just have to stay in abject poverty right and the chance to get out of poverty is itself a benefit right so that's what I've got on the pro it ended up being a little bit stronger than I thought it would be so now let's flip over and talk about what I think is the theoretically stronger side which is the con All right, last but not least, let's do some con arguments. We said earlier that I thought initially that the con had a significant upper hand in the debate for a couple of reasons. I've moderated that a bit. I think that I think the advantage is a little bit smaller than I initially thought, but I still feel like the con has a more compelling story to tell for a couple of reasons. The first is the framing of the resolution, right? And that is just the idea that this resolution asks us not to look to the future and ask what West Africa should do, which is where a lot of the, the hope you know, about urbanization in West Africa lies is what it might do in the future. But but this resolution, if I'm the con, I'm going to say, no, 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 that's not what this is about. This is asking us to take a snapshot and do a cost benefit analysis of whether urbanization is actually making the lives of West Africans better today. And I want to point to the, the very strong evidence that it is in fact not doing that. And it has a lot of contrary effects that's actually harming folks, right? So I think that's really important. I think that gives the con a major advantage if you can win that framing fight that we're not looking to the future, we're looking to the present. And then the second is just the fact that so much of the literature the overwhelming bulk of the literature is pointing out, frankly, the defects right in urbanization in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And part of that is, you know, if you're an academic, you, you don't write articles to say, hey, everything's great, right? Most of the time when you write articles, you know, to get published, you're, you're trying to identify problems. And that's certainly the case here. But but the overwhelming majority of the of the literature is pointing out with a very strong consensus that the urbanization in that we're seeing in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa is just not leading to the levels of growth that you see. You, you need, frankly, two pieces to be able to make these arguments. And one is to be able to explain them and the other is to have the cards. So, you know, I, I think there are a few sort of stock issues that you're going to use in, in many different con cases. So let's just jump right into them, right? So the first one's going to be urbanization in West Africa isn't producing economic benefits. And you're going to need to just sort of hit hit the pro right in the mouth, right? Because they're going to be arguing about the poverty reduction benefits and the economic benefits of urbanization, and you're going to need to hit back on that. And like I said, you know, you need to have both the evidence, but also the explanation. You need to be able to tell the story about the data, like we said at the beginning of the video. And one of the stories you're going to have to tell is to explain why just because you see lower levels of poverty in cities as opposed to rural areas, that doesn't mean that the city is reducing the poverty, right? And there are good pieces like the Homan and Law piece that help explain why that might be the case, right? And they explain that these cities are not, you know, creating unique economic opportunities. They might be just siphoning people out of rural areas. Like if you are a person in a rural area that can scrape together a few hundred bucks 
to make your way to a city, right? Well, then you might be somebody who's a little more advantaged than your neighbor and you go to the city, you know, to, to, to do a little bit better, but there's no great economic opportunity waiting for you there. It's just a little bit less bad, right? And you need to be able to explain why that's the case, right? But in addition to that, as with everything, you got to have cards. You got to have evidence that you can read. And so a couple of good examples on the slide here. The first one is from uh, Law, who's half of the Homan and Law team, right? Uh, and he's just talking about how, as we've talked about before, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa lags far behind other regions at comparable times in their history in terms of uh, the wealth generation and the poverty alleviation that they saw as a result of uh, urbanization. Even better than that, though, is the Turok and McGranahan piece from 2013 that we have here. And this is actually citing another study. And you, you, I will say this. You'll want to mine a lot of these pieces. Turok and McGranahan, Homan and Law, those are two good examples. They both have you know, their own internal source citations that you can look to for more stuff. But, but Turok and McGranahan in particular, they actually have some good sources potentially for the pro about like statistical uh, reasons why you might actually see some growth. So I definitely read both of them. But, but, but this particular card is talking about how, and this is why it's so impressive, right, is that uh, urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa not only is not pulling people out of poverty, it's causing poverty. In 71% of 32 sub-Saharan African countries, you're seeing a correlation between urbanization and a drop in GDP. So we're not only not raising GDP, we're actually affirmatively putting it down, right? And this is the basic story that every con is gonna wanna tell, that these cities are just places people go because they're desperate. They don't have the industries to give them opportunities. They come in, they live in slums. It's It may be marginally less bad than the, than the, um, than the countryside, but not because of anything urbanization is doing is just because this is where everyone is going, right? Again, the phrase I've used is these cities are getting bigger without getting better. And you cannot link to any of the general benefits of global urbanization. And you have to be really staunch about that, right? You have to say, no, if you're reading evidence from Asia, if you're reading evidence from Europe, if you're reading evidence from the United States as some kind of comparison, cut that right out, judge, don't consider it. Here are some cards about why urbanization in Africa is different. It is not as robust. You cannot consider those impacts. They're not going to happen here, right? Now, in terms of generating offense for the con, there are a number of good options. Uh, one of the most likely, I think, is going to be the housing crisis. So this comes from Andrew Chimponda, who's a managing director of a, of a I, I guess, a shelter group in Africa, um, uh, published by Genoa in September of 2018. Uh, and it just talks about the, 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 the lack of affordable housing that's a result of people flocking to these cities. An obvious result of urbanization is that people flock to cities in hopes of finding work, and Africa is no different. 40,000 people are moving to African cities each day. However, in Africa, this transition has resulted in massive housing shortages, amounting to up to 56 million units. Of these, more than 90% are affordable housing units. He also talks about how the overall deficit in terms of housing, like how much you'd have to spend to have affordable housing, is a $1.4 trillion deficit, right? So, and then in addition to that, you know, uh, Brookings 2020 talks about how, you know, what do you do when you don't have housing? Well, you know, in these cities in West Africa, you live in a slum. And, you know, this would be one of those areas where it'd be great if we could use like visual aids in debate. I don't think there's a rule against it, but you generally don't. But, to, you know, you've seen it in doing your research. These are truly slums. They're, they're places that are, you know, pieced together. They're dirty. They're dangerous. They're unsanitary. Uh, they, they lack many basic amenities that we take for granted. But, but uh, Brookings talks about how 60% of people in urban population centers live in slums. So these massive, dangerous, slum, unsanitary places are growing up, you know, around these cities. And that's where the growth is happening. It's not growth in income. It's just growth in, in frankly, places that, that most people would probably not want to live, right? This is not only an impact in and of itself. I know I think we would argue that housing shortages and living in slums is bad enough. But also, if you look to Think Global Health in March 2020, we can try to link this, you know, I think to, to health problems. And it talks about how this shortage of housing has devastating impacts. Namely, the shortage inevitably leads to the spread of infectious diseases as they are impossible to contain in dense informal settlements that lack clean water, sanitation, ventilation, and health care. In a region where respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, and vector-borne infections are already among the leading causes of death, the prospect of persistent health crises in Africa's growing city as a serious challenge for the future, right? You might even try, if you wanted to be really cute, to maybe link it to COVID-19 risks, although I don't personally have any cards on that. And then the last point that was brought to my attention, actually, uh, Mia, you know, one of our debaters, I wish we had Mia in the videos more often. Our studio is actually 
been shut down for technical issues, so she couldn't be in this when I had to film at my office. But she actually mentioned that one of the ways that Africa is coping with these housing shortages is they are turning to uh, construction cooperation from China in order to build affordable housing units. Now, on the one hand, Pro might use that to argue that um, that the problem's not as bad. On the other hand, some con teams might run that dependency on China for housing and just general dependency on China is its own problem. That's getting a little bit far afield. I'm not saying it's a bad argument. It's just kind of getting out there into the weeds and we really don't have time for it. But you can see how you can follow some of these, these strings to where they lead and have a number of different impacts. Now, in addition to that, I, mean, I think the one that you're going to see from a lot of con teams, it's kind of inevitable, is the idea of environmental impact and climate harms. We will link to a couple of pieces that talk about environmental issues generally, like resource depletion and, and you know, uh, settling you know, more land and, and moving wildlife and things off of it. But the biggest single impact to talk about in the video, of course, is climate change. Um, the, the simplest thing to say here, I think, and this is a piece from McGee and York in 2018, is that as a general matter, Urbanization has a pretty strong correlation with increasing CO2 emissions, which of omission emissions, right? Uh, which which is what mainly drives uh, man-made climate change, right? And as you can see here, it has some pretty good data about how increases in urbanization lead to net per capita per person increases in uh, CO2 emissions, which fuels climate change. And then in addition to that, we can talk about how not only does urbanization drive climate change generally, but also there's a World Health Organization article in 2012 that talks about how the urban poor in Africa actually feel the effects of climate change more acutely because they are living in areas that are poor, with more floods, with more erratic weather, with less uh, reliable access to clean water and things like that. Climate change, floods, droughts, things like that. Uh, are going to hurt them the worst, right? And if you've seen some of the pictures of some of these slums, which are literally built up in areas where they're on stilts, like water comes in below them on a regular basis in places like Lagos, uh, you know, like Nigeria, uh, you can see how that would be the case, right? Uh, another argument that I think, you know, I would certainly consider on the con is the idea that uh, urbanization is, is harming social cohesion. Now, you know, historically, there has been this common belief that urbanization, at least in the long run, leads to greater social cohesion. People from different racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and other groups move together into a city, and they have to sort of learn to get along with each other, maybe imperfectly. And it might not be perfect, but it's better than if everybody lives out in their own like rural enclave, right? That's the general theory. But there is some evidence, and this is from Stephen Commons in the fragility to stability piece that we talked about earlier, that that's not really happening in a lot of these uh, sub-Saharan African cities. And the basic reason is, you know, the reason folks have to get along in cities, sometimes it's called being like too busy and too prosperous to hate. We're all here to make more money. We're doing well for ourselves. You know, we, we need to learn to get along with each other. This was Atlanta's motto, motto for a long time. Atlanta is a city in the South, but they, they argued that they were too busy to hate because they were too busy making money, so they had to learn to get along racially, right? The argument is in a lot of these cities, people are not, you know, getting wealthier, and people tend to congregate with their own ethnic groups, language groups, religious groups, things like that, in close, you know, uh, contact with people of other groups, but still with their own folks. Uh, and it leads to, as you can see in the piece, you know, greater xenophobic hostility, and that rather than, than solving these social cohesion problems, it's actually making the social cohesion problems worse, right? And then the last thing I think I would say, you know, on the con side of things is I would say that the, the pro, you know, is going to have a really difficult time meeting its burden uh, because the resolution requires you to make a generalizable statement about an entire region of the world. And as we talked about earlier, you know, West Africa is an incredibly diverse area that ranges from massive megacities that are fairly prosperous in some cases to remote rural regions to small to mid-sized cities that are incredibly impoverished. And it's very, very difficult to argue, you know, overall that there's any general single rule about whether cities are good or bad. Now, I think the con can actually win the argument that the cities just haven't been successful. I think there's enough evidence, as you'll see in the links, to win that. But, you know, one thing that I might throw into the mix just to, you know, siphon a little time away from the pro and make their life a little bit more difficult. Sorry, pro, but, you know, this is what I would do. I would say, look, at the end of the day, 
you know, especially if they're citing evidence that is either too general, like it's sub-Saharan Africa in general, or too specific, like it's anecdotal evidence about a couple of cities or a particular country, I would point out that, you know, their burden is to establish a general rule for a, um, a region that is, you know, as populous as the entire United States that has economic diversity that's greater than the United States and all other kinds of diversity. And I would frankly say this, this is a little bit ridiculous. It's like coming in and asking you to say, you know, on balance, cities are good in America. Well, I mean, come on, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, Flint, Michigan, with all of its economic struggles, is a very, very different situation than San Francisco, California, with its, you know, world-beating prosperity from the tech sector. And, you know, one common sense argument, you know, in some rounds that a judge may buy is that, look, if you don't believe that this is a general, general rule that we can accept in all cases, or at least in most cases, then, then you don't have enough to vote for the pro. So those are some potential strategies on the con. Um, and with that, we will move on now to some final thoughts. So the final thoughts on this are fairly straightforward, which is what I said at the beginning, which is this is a topic that's going to reward you for understanding the, the underlying rationales for, for where the issue comes from, right? It's something that many of your judges are not going to have a lot of background on. So the ability in crossfire and in rebuttals to slow it down just a little bit and explain and tell the story of exactly why the data says what you say it says and what the judge should be looking at and what they should be voting on. I will tell you guys that you know when I judge debate rounds, I see so many of you, you're smart people, you've got good sources, but the biggest defect I see in like the middle 80% of PF rounds that I judge is the total inability to tell a clear link story to like slow down and give me 15 or 20 seconds where you stop reading cards and stop jumping from one little fight to another little fight on the flow and tell the story of what you're trying to get me to believe, right? What do all the cards add up to? And I think this is one where the ability to slow it down and say, look, you know, this is not leading to economic growth, but it has tangible harms. Yes, poverty is lower in these cities, but it's not because the city's just making it lower. There's a zero sum game, right? The cities are getting bigger and not better. And that's what we should be looking at here, right? The ability to just tell that simple, plain language story on either side of the debate, I think is super important. I think it's also, again, important to be very respectful of the fact that this is an incredibly diverse, large region of the world uh, and not try to generalize too much. It's important to be able to explain why there's a little bit of a lack of data on West Africa specifically and why we feel that it is okay to use Sub-Saharan African data. Uh, you know, but, but overall, you know, I think it's a pretty decent topic. I think it's one that is going to be challenging for a lot of folks, uh, but I hope you guys have fun with it. Uh, so at any rate, we'll wrap it up for this time and we will see you again, uh, in March for both PF and LD. And until then we'll say what we always say, which is debate is for everybody. So remember, work hard, have fun and hail state.